Um, we are on day six um, of our 10 days of prayer. And we are looking at uh, something very important. Um, praying with uh, what one might call a bit of endurance, a bit of grit, a bit of stubbornness um, into prayer, uh, some persistence um, into the prayer life, okay? And, and, and I just want to look at a, a story that we are quite familiar with. In the book of Matthew, chapter 15, starting from verse 21 to 28, Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28, it says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered uh, her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was, I was not sent except to the lost ship of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Help me, uh, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs uh, which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed immediately. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of life and thank you for the moments of prayer, both personal and corporate. We thank you for the engagements we have with you. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word is already established since we started to pray that you are a God who hears prayer. Now help us to build the solid foundation on your word so that we may pray not simply what comes from our hearts only, but our faith may be boosted by the knowledge that we pray founded on your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Matthew records um, this particular story about this uh, Syrophoenician uh, woman. It's one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. Uh, but I want to look at it uh, precisely from the context of prayer. We pray, and sometimes it does happen that God will answer our prayers immediately. Um, there are times when I've prayed to God and the answer came in a matter of, you know, an hour or two, and what I had asked for had happened. And there are times also when I have prayed and um, things happened only a few years later, and there are prayers that I've prayed, which up till now, the answer has not uh, yet uh, arrived to me or, or in, in, in that sense. And then comes this question, um, both rooted in Luke chapter 18, uh, where Jesus uh, in that parable teaches us to uh, not give, give lose heart. That's what he says, in fact, in, 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 in uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 1, he says, don't lose heart um, uh, when you pray, okay? And he tells us the parable about the judge and the widow precisely so that we may know that we shouldn't lose heart when we pray. God does answer prayer and answers swiftly. Yes, uh, God swiftly may, may not necessarily tie with ours because God answers in perfect timing. We pray in perfect pressure. God answers in perfect control. I think that's the issue between us and God, why we are not uh, getting him. Um, we tend to pray in, in, in pressure. He answers in perfect control. So his answers are not designed to respond to pressure. They are designed to affirm his control and his will. And, 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 and that matters. Uh, that matters, beloved. And let me explain why. If God answered prayers 
which we prayed according to the pressure we were under. Please understand this. As much as it would please us that we got the answer when we were under pressure, it would also in one way suggest we have a God who is not in control of things, who also has to be on emergency like we are. Because please understand, the reason I pray urgent prayers is as a declaration of my weakness as a human being. I am declaring to God that something has happened which I could not plan for nor foresee. And now it is disrupting my life and I need help. So that very prayer is my admission of my limitations. When, when it doesn't matter what we are praying for, once we are praying for something that we feel, oh, God needs to answer me and answer me now. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's us. We are human. That's our perspective. That's where we are. It's our right to pray that way where we are. We, we shouldn't want to take God's responsibility in, in prayer. No, let God be God. Let humans be humans. So we do that. But now imagine if every urgent prayer we prayed was answered immediately. It might communicate that God himself was not aware that it was going to happen. So he himself is now rushing to cover it as urgently as we need it to be covered. And, and yes, there are times when we will pray urgent prayers and God will answer now. However, my reading of the Bible shows me that that is because answering at that time is also in accordance with his will. That is why sometimes we pray urgent prayers according to us and God doesn't answer. You know, I cannot tell you how many times personally I have gone to God fully believing beyond any reasonable doubt that if he does not answer now, I am undone, I am finished, it is over with me. And years later, I'm still around. The moment which I thought would finish me came and passed. And I was sustained. I don't know if, if what I'm saying makes sense. I wasn't answered, but I was sustained. So what I wanted, I didn't get. But instead, what I was given is power to live through it. But I was very sure, approaching it, that if I am not answered now, I am undone. And instead of God rushing with me, he chose to provide me power to meet the moment that I thought would finish me and to pass it and to look back and think, oh, oh, I could have sworn that was the end of me. But I'm here. I've passed it. So that has always for me been a moment that reminds me that God does not operate on emergencies like me. That if I pray for an emergency and God answers, it may not be because I presented an emergency, but because it is aligned with his control to give that answer at that time. And if it were not aligned with his control, then he will let me live through the moment and sustain me through it. And later on, I will have time to reflect and realize, oh, okay, maybe what was an emergency on my part was really not an emergency. God saw it, God knew about it, and God knew it wouldn't finish me. Though in my panic, I was very sure this is it. This is the end of the road and nothing comes after this. But God knew, oh, years are still coming after this moment. So, you know, let's just allow you to live through it. And sometimes it, you will reflect with humor, um, beloved, in the sense that 
when those moments have passed, when those days of the end of me have passed, in whatever form they may be, sometimes we reflect with a bit of humor as we realize the level at which I panicked and stressed and 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 went crazy. And now I'm like it's gone, it's done, it's over. And and you begin to reflect and think, why did I stress so much? So there's a level at which we need to understand that when God answers a prayer, he is not answering like an ambulance called to an accident scene. I, I say this again. If God was like an ambulance, then, beloved, we would be in trouble because it would mean we worship a God who is as surprised by problems as we are. If God answered every emergency we called him for, it would create it for me would have a theologically big problem. It would mean God himself doesn't know what I'm going to deal with unless I deal with it myself. And then I update him. That, hey, are you aware that this is about to happen? And then God himself says, oh, my goodness, I wasn't aware. Let's deal with it now, now, now. I think the fact that I go to God kicking and screaming and he looks at me and 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 and, and he says, give him power, give him strength, give him life to live through this moment. And, and at that time, um, his power is dispersed towards me uh, and life is given to me. And as I count down the hours, the minutes and the seconds to my final moment of crisis where everything will fall apart and, and God just silently says, leave, leave through it. Yes, I say leave. And when that moment comes, you know, that Ezekiel 16 uh, verse, I called it out to you. I said, leave. Yes, I said, leave. And when that moment where you were expecting to die, instead, God fills it with life. You were expecting it to be the crisis and God fills it with life. And then you get through the moment and nothing takes you away. You know, the event happens. Sometimes you know, sometimes God will allow us to live through that moment and the event we thought was going to happen and finish us. It doesn't. But sometimes he'll let it happen. The moment it does happen, you actually get fired from work. You actually get retrenched or whatever situation or a loved one actually does die. And at that moment of God not preventing it, there's a sense of, oh, my goodness, how could I pray and God doesn't listen to me? But then minutes turn to hours and weeks and months and years, and we realize we've survived it. Yes, God didn't stop it, but we survived it. And so it didn't threaten our existence or our way of life as much as we had thought while approaching it. So there is a sense of faith and confidence that one should have in a God who is not an ambulance of prayer because it affirms that while, while we may pray in perfect pressure, he answers in perfect control. For him, his answers must reflect on his children that he is God and is in charge. That means even my urgent situations, they will be answered according to his control. If it benefits the revelation of his power and control to answer me now, then he will do so. But if it benefits his power and control and ultimately my faith in him to let me live through what I thought would finish me. Because, beloved, sometimes we need that. We need to live through the things that we thought would finish us so that we may be reminded that who is really in charge? Is it the things we fear or the God we worship? I, I read the Bible and I get the sense that when we fear something to the level of equal to the level at which we fear God, then God needs us 
to live through it so that it is determined who then is bigger than the issue. You know, because I think sometimes if God does, if we fear something so much, we fear it happening so much that the fear of it is now equal to our worship of God. They are now toe to toe. I think that when God answers that emergency of fear, in one way, he is then validating that indeed the threat was as big as we thought. And in, 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 in some uncomfortable way, it, it theologically sets up a God who was matched by the problem. That's why he needed to rush and answer. May just said, but 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 if I live through it, I get to realize who's in charge. If I meet it, and all my fear of it brings me close to a heart attack, and then it happens, but it doesn't finish me, then I I understand what Jeremiah meant when he said. It is because of his mercies that we have not been consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. Because understand what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is not saying it is because of his mercies that the problems were prevented. He says, no, the problem came, but we were not consumed. So we got to discover that there's a God bigger than the problem we were afraid of. The problem came and it did knock us. But by his mercies, we were not consumed. In other words, as the problem was doing its best to destroy me, I found myself sustained during the problem as the three Hebrew boys in the fire. The fire isn't taken out, but I'm sustained through it so that as I am continuing to live and thrive in the midst of my fire, I then realize, oh, oh, Jesus was correct. Greater is the one that is within than the one that is without. Greater is the one that keeps me than the one who engineered the problem I was afraid of. Because the problem has arrived, but I am not undone. I'm still here. The problem came. Yes, I'm now unemployed. I've been unemployed for five years, for 10 years. But I'm here. And I'm, I'm, I'm alive. This thing that I thought when it happens, war unto me. Now God has demonstrated that I should never fear anything in the same intensity as I worship him. My worship of him should always rise above the intensity of the things I am afraid of. Now, this, this lady comes to Jesus and, and she presents this petition. She says to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is heavily demon-possessed. I, I, I will not deal with all that. This is a powerful story. And if I had to deal with each element, I would first preach for an hour before we even get to the prayer. I just want to touch on the issues that relate to this prayer issue in, 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 in this story. So, you know, you may be thinking to yourself, why is the pastor skipping this or that? It's because I'm only focusing on the prayer part on, on, on this story. And, and initially, Jesus doesn't pay attention. Then the disciples reply. The disciples say um, to, to Jesus, send her away. Send her away. She's making noise, you know. And, and Jesus says to this lady, you know, I was only sent to the uh, 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 lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then the Bible says, then she ran to his feet and worshipped him. Then he replies and says, it is not good, uh, woman, to take the bread of the children and give it to the little dogs. And she, of course, replies and says, yes, I agree. Yet, even dogs do get 
crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus, uh, in the end, says to her, woman, um, you have great faith. Go your way. What you desire has been uh, 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 given to you. As, as, a, as a footnote, when Jesus is, equates this woman to a dog, I, I would quickly want to please caution. There's a long historical background to the issue of dogs and Syrophoenicians. I, I know many people have been troubled by this story where they see Jesus as very rude to this woman. A and I agree. If you read it only knowing what you know in 2024, you might think so. But if you did proper biblical research, you would understand why she was not offended. There's a long history in this story about dogs and Syrophoenicians, and she knew what Jesus meant. That is why she responded by faith rather than by offense. Okay? But I just don't have time to deal with it. But I thought I should allay those fears because I know many people have been troubled by this story. They've never really been able to get over how Jesus answers. B biblical historical research would answer what is happening. So she makes the first request. The first thing I want to talk about is prayer and community in persistent prayer. This The, the, the disciples say, say to Jesus, please send her away. That is how they respond. Send her away. She's praying. They say, send her away. I, I need us to understand that persistent prayer um, and prayer in general has an influence on our community, the community we live with. Because we don't always pray alone. We pray with families. We pray with church members. We, we, we are part of prayer groups, you know, formed in different ways for different reasons. Some, some of us, we, we have things that we are presenting to God continually. And at times you may not realize this, but prayer can, your prayer can affect your community both positively and negatively. There are communities uh, sometimes that are frustrated when you pray. Because they feel they know what they are going to say. You say this all the time. And 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 maybe and, and there's a sense of dismissing, you know. Sometimes it's 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 the reality of prayer and community. Sometimes when you are praying in a community, because your spiritual community may know what you are going through and you've been presenting it to God for years. The, some communities can respond like the disciples. There can be a sense of annoyance because the community feels uh we know this already get over it pray for other things now and, but the community may not verbalize it you know um even when i speak of community i may even mean your pastor even your your prayer leader in church you know because you've been bothering them about this issue Please pray with me over this or over that, you know, uh, and you keep repeating it. Please pray with me over this because for you, it's not done. It's not been resolved. God has not answered. But the community can res respond like the disciples. The community can respond in a way that that says, oh, oh, oh can she just be dismissed? Can he just be dismissed? We, we've heard this already. We are tired of this. And that's why it's so important, beloved. Uh, I believe that it's so important to also know how to carry yourself in prayer without a community. Let's deal with the reality of what this story says. Are, this the, are these the disciples of Jesus? Yes. Are they meant to help him in the gospel work? Yes. But what are they doing now? They are getting annoyed. Instead of finding joy that Jesus is going to save another life, they are getting annoyed. So I need us to be very realistic. Let's not pretend like the, the spiritual community is always excited to carry our burdens. Yes, sometimes the community will be there for you. But there are times when the community of God will get annoyed. 
we are not holier than the people in the Bible. If these guys were annoyed by a request, believe you me, there's a pastor who's getting annoyed with praying for you for the same thing. Uh, you know, th there's a prayer leader who's getting annoyed. They may not say it to your face, but they may be getting annoyed with the repetition or, or whatever it may be. That is why it's so important to not over rely on the idea that others must carry you in prayer. Learn to carry yourself as well and wrestle with God. I say this because there are people who don't pray for themselves, by themselves. They are always looking for a community to do it. But beloved, the community doesn't always have the patience for you. Not from a bad position. Sometimes it's because the members of the community are going through their own lives. They are frustrated by this or that or that or the other. And when you come asking for prayer, you found them at the wrong time. You know, they are they, mentally, emotionally, they are not there. They are wrestling with other things with God. I've met so many people who, who are struggling with personal prayer. And so they just want to keep throwing it to the community of believers for the community to carry them through. No, beloved, the community will not always be able to carry you. Learn to wrestle also with God for yourself. Learn to present yourself to God. And again, as I say, not because the community is evil, but because the community is also going through life itself. Sometimes the community is just not emotionally ready to, to carry you. I'm a pastor and I know it happens to me as well. There are times when I'm just not okay myself. I'm, I'm not okay. But the, the, the requests for prayer keep coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. And you know what's funny about it? No one ever asks you before they ask for the prayer. No one ever asks, Pastor, are you okay? Um, how are you doing? You know, uh, I, 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 are you in a spiritually fit space? Um, you know, because I want to ask you to pray for me, but I, I also wouldn't want to maybe disrupt you may be going through something that's never asked people just want to pastor pray for me pastor pray for me pastor pray for me and you may be in a space where you are saying to god i don't want to talk to you about other people can we talk about me because of a b c d and and so the community may not always be able to carry you so that even when the community may not be there for you at that time you can still carry the conversation with God yourself. So that's the first thing I pick up from this story, that the, the, we must not be ignorant of the community. Then the second aspect that I, I, I want to raise uh, from this story is the aspect of worship. So Jesus has answered her the first time, and it's not the answer that she would have wanted to hear. Then the Bible says, and she came and worshipped him. And this is important because here the Bible is teaching us a very spiritually intelligent balance between supplicating your prayer and reaching a point where now I am no longer telling you what I'm looking for. I've told you enough. I've emptied my heart on what I'm looking for. Now it's time for exaltation. It's time for worship. Now, I, I, I would like to make an African um, 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 illustration on this one. And I do apologize, but I'm hoping in each and every culture represented here, you may understand what I'm trying to, to present. The significance of worship in prayer. You know, in, in my culture, we have clan names. So we don't just have a surname, okay? Um, you know, maybe if you are born in the UK, your, your, your surname is going to be Smith, and then that's it. Not with us Africans. I am Mazibugo, that's my surname. But I have what is called clan names. Clan names are poems and songs of my ancestors, who they were, what did they achieve, what were they known for? 
and they are attached to the surname. That's how we are made to know our genealogy and the history and where we come from. Now, you know, in Africa, if you ask your father for something, you keep asking and he doesn't give it to you. There's another trick that we use. In Instead of coming to say, please buy me a cell phone, please buy me a cell phone, please buy me a cell phone, please buy me a cell phone. You just come to him and, and, and instead of saying, please buy me a cell phone, you sing the clan names, the clan praises, okay? You, 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 it's a poem. Uh, uh, you sing out this, this great rhythm of your family history and where you come from. You know what that does? Because in our clan names are the achievements of our ancestors, what it does to your father, he then visually sees all of them and their achievements standing around him, saying to him, if we achieved this much for the generations that came after us, why are you failing your children? How will you join us one day in terms of clan names when you can't even answer such little things? You see, it's a form of worship. Immediately, believe me, that trick always works, especially on Southern African fathers. Once you have sung the clan names, you've made him come to face to face with the achievements of our ancestors. And he feels embarrassed that he can't provide this when he descends from people who've achieved so much. And believe you me, the man gets up and makes a plan. Gets up, makes a plan. And, and that's what worship is. Worship is no longer submitting the list. Worship is moving to a point where you say, I know who you are, God, your clan names. I know who you are and what you've done before. When we sing God's clan names, worship, we go back to Genesis. We say, we know you to be this God who created the universe out of nothing. You are the God who made us from the ground and breathed life into us. You are a God who opened the Red Sea. We are beginning to sing clan names. What are we saying? We are saying, I know for a fact that what I have submitted to you is not beyond your capabilities. I know your clan names, God. I know them. So what I am asking for right now is not beyond who you are. Persistent prayer is not always about submitting the list all the time. It's also knowing how to move to worship. Move from submitting a list to worshiping. Okay? A prayer is not persistent because you keep repeating the same thing. A prayer can be persistent even when you stop mentioning what you want, but take it to worship now. Where you say, I'm done submitting a list. You are not a deaf God. I'm done submitting it. Now I'm going to worship you. Now I'm going to exalt you for the things you've done before, which clearly show that you are able even to do this. Sing him, sing him praises and worship of the things he has done in your life. Don't stop in the Bible. Tell him, you are the God who did this for my parents. They have told me stories of what you did for them when they were going through this or this or that. You are the God who took me through university when my parents couldn't afford. You are the God who did this for me. You are the God who found me that job. Remember when I wanted that job and I cried to you and you gave it to me. This is my history with you. Persistent prayer doesn't mean always submitting a list. It also involves worship. Lastly, Jesus says, okay, lady, do you see the power of prayer and worship? Now, Jesus says, okay, I get you. And he says, you see, 
But you now you are asking me to take the, the children's bread and give it to you, to the little dogs. And she says, of course, of course. Even, even the little dogs can get crumbs from the master's table. And that's my last submission about persistent prayer this evening. Be careful. Don't get distracted into debating with God things that are in the periphery. Focus on what you came for. Focus. You see, when praying, listen to this. Jesus raises an issue. You know, I cannot take the bread of the children and give it to the dogs. This lady could have entered a debate with him about dogs and bread. Look at what she does. She doesn't bother debating the statement. She says, okay, if that's your view, fine. Let's go along with that view. If the view is I a, a, a little dogs shouldn't get bread of the children, let's go along with that view. Let's not start a philosophical debate. In that view, still continuing with that view, they do get the crumbs. So many times we need to understand in persistent prayer, don't get lost on things that don't matter. Don't open debates that are not the focal point of your prayer. Because when we see our prayers not being answered, we start opening little chat rooms around the prayer where we are beginning to open discussions, discussions which lead to doubt, and anger, those discussions, watch out for them. They may grow and become so big that the prayer room gets smaller and smaller while the debate rooms get bigger, bigger, and bigger. Focus. Focus on what you came for in, came for in your prayer. Focus. Zoom in on it. Stay on it. Don't let the little rooms popping up around the prayer distract you. Believe you me, very not long from now, those little rooms will have become huge stadiums where noises of doubt and confusion are now having the platform, the major room is the room where you pray in faith. And persistent prayer requires that we keep focus. Please don't lose focus of what you've come to God for. Because that is what happens when we pray. While we are praying, a little room opens in the corner. I wonder if I'm even praying correctly. Another room opens in the corner. Ah, but have I ever even seen God answering anyone with this prayer request, another room pops up in the corner. Ah, 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 ah. Could it be also that God won't answer me, considering that I didn't do this and do that? And as those rooms increase, you will notice you even lose concentration on the prayer. You are now entertaining all these rooms around your prayer such that the prayer dies. Focus, my brothers and sisters. This lady, focus. She did not open rooms of debate. She focused. And in the end, Jesus says, your great faith, your great faith has been rewarded. Go what you want has been done. So there are three things about persistent prayer for me coming from this story. One, learn to carry yourself in prayer. The community may not have the stamina to carry you all the time. Two, watch out for worship. It can be a powerful tool instead of resubmitting the same list over and over again. Three, keep focus. Keep focused on prayer. Keep focused on prayer, lest the things that are popping up around your prayer life end up becoming bigger than what you were 
praying for in the first place. May God bless you and may God keep you.